Welcome to our second Saturday, Centaur Saturday Salon online in 2022. My name is Ida Holmes and I'm the Artistic and Executive Director at Centaur Theatre. I want to acknowledge the privilege it is to live and work on the island of Montreal, also known as Jojage, which is considered the traditional territory of the Ganigahaga Nation and has been a point of creativity and exchange for millennia for Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. The Salon series is part of our artistic diversity discussion at Centaur, which is generously supported by Canada Life. Today, I am joined by award-winning actor and playwright Omari Newton. Welcome to the Salon, Omari. I've been looking really forward to talking to you ever since Quincy told me that he was going to commission a new play from you back before the pandemic rearranged our world. <laughs> thank you. That's really kind of you to say, and, and it's really, I'm looking forward to talking to you, and thank you for having me. Oh, fantastic. I was really inspired, actually, also by your TED Talk from Whistler. And in that TED Talk, you talk, you tell the story of how you discovered the power of rap um, in your, you know, when you were a child. Could you talk about that and what that relate, how that relates to becoming an actor? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I, uh, thanks to having very progressive, cool parents, um, art and activism and empowerment have always been inextricably linked for me because I was introduced to art through my parents who, when I was probably way too young to, uh, to have, you know, watch this stuff, they were like, you've got to watch uh, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. And Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing was a gateway into Public Enemy, which was a gateway into hip hop. So... I, yeah, some of the first art that I that I was exposed to was uh, hip hop and and films that used elements of hip hop. So it was a huge influence on me. And um, are your what made your parents so hip? Like, how, were they particularly young, or was it just their? What can you talk about your parents just a little bit? You know, I I, I don't know if they were. It's funny hearing my parents and hip associated together makes me laugh. But uh, <laughs> they, they, I don't know if it was a product of them coming up. You know, they were from Trinidad and Tobago, but they moved in the uh, early seventies to Montreal. And I know they were heavily influenced by uh, civil rights movements. Uh, you know, in in America, and I don't know if that was just this generation where. Uh, knowledge of self and Afrocentricity was, was paramount, as of course it would be at a time when, you know, Black people didn't have equal rights, observably didn't have equal rights. So it was just always really important to them to instill a sense of pride in their children about being Black and to to know our, our history and to, to speak up. So, yeah, I, I don't know why they're so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and and then did that did uh, did you start rapping as a you started rapping as a kid, and then yeah. did, you, did that take you to to theater school or did that take you into acting? Can you talk about how that kind of? Uh huh. I I literally wrote my first rap in elementary school. I was in probably the the first grade, and it was and hilariously, it literally was a political rap. I wrote an, a rap about recycling, and I remember the first. <laughs> <laughs> the opening lines were waste not want not save uh save today start recycling right away <laughs> but I, was, I was writing like politically charged leftist hip-hop as a the first grader and um if, as as i mentioned in my ted talk i'd always loved uh performing and i'd always loved expressing myself through art i was a big reader reading was big in our house and, you know of course like all kids i read a lot of dr seuss so maybe dr seuss was what got me into rhyming um, One fish, blue fish, red fish, blue fish. <laughs> yeah. right? Hey, listen, I've, I've seen videos of teachers uh, reading Dr. Seuss over hip hop beats and it flows nicely. He's got a nice flow. <laughs> um, but I, as I mentioned in my TED talk, I was born with uh, polyps on my vocal cords. Right. So I was one of those kids that had that really like raspy voice like this. And, and I used to lose my voice uh, quite a bit until I had surgery in the third grade to remove the polish from my vocal cord. So it was this weird thing where I had all these ideas and I loved performing, but I had this physical uh, impediment to expressing myself. And when it was removed, I just felt like it was this, the world opened up where I could finally voice, like literally voice the thoughts I had in my head, so. That's amazing. I, I, I had, yeah, it's incredible. And then did you go to theater school or did you just start acting? So I didn't officially go to theater school ever, uh, uh -huh. but I, I started acting, I remember, I was on the Greendale Elementary School improv team in the third grade. 
And and I was actually when I was even younger than that, um, at my church play, we we went to this church in uh, in TMR. I don't even remember the name of the church, but in the town of Mount Royal, we went to this church. And I, I joke and laugh and say I was cast as a uh, Joseph in the Nativity play, and I was like. <laughs> It was a very progressive director because I remember my, you know, my partner was a white woman. So even back then, I was trailblazing in diversity, being cast as Black <laughs> Joseph. That was the, but yeah, I, I started I started acting when I was really really young. Never officially went to theater school. I got a degree in uh, communications from Concordia University, okay. but all of my electives basically, like the, the communications building was uh, at the it used to be the TJ building at the Loyola campus. Uh -huh. So oh every, yeah. Everyone thought I was in theater. Actually, it's funny. I did Blue Orange at the Centaur while I was a student at Concordia, and everyone thought I was in theater because I, I would basically spend all my time with the theater students at the theater building. That's it's it's fantastic because you you did actually um, make your debut with uh, actually you didn't debut with Blue Orange though you debuted with Black Theater Workshop mm -hmm. I think in um, in uh, was it Andrew Moody's play. Uh, that wasn't my debut, oh, but I did. I did. I my debut was my children, my Africa at Black oh, Theater yeah. Workshop. Totally willing. Yeah, to fantastic. Yeah, uh, it was uh, Apple Fugard. Apple. Oh, Apple sorry. Fugard. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so I did. I, that was, that? Sorry. Go ahead. What year was that? That was 1999, and I I remember because I had been accepted into Concordia's communications program. I was 19 when we started rehearsals, and I. I remember getting cast in this role and having to make this difficult decision of like deferring my university acceptance to pursue my acting career. And and again, I don't know why my parents are so cool, but they were like, yeah, you should do the play. Like they, they were basically like, at some point, get a degree, but this is a great opportunity and we get it. And they, they was, they've always been fully supportive of me. What a great introduction to being an actor that uh, as a way to like, that's incredible. Who directed that show? I was Kate Bly, who was, she was at the time, Kate Bly was the artistic director of uh, Black Theater Workshop. And and it was interesting because one, yeah, my introduction to theater was this, you know, highly political, uh, incre I mean, just such beautiful, incredible writing, like the monologues and that were amazing. Um, and Kate Bly was this uh, classically, or is a, a classically trained, she studied uh, in England and introduced me to Uta Hagen and text analysis. And, and like from a very young age at 19, and, and of course, actually, Tyrone Benskin uh, played um, Mr. M in that play. So he, yeah. Tyrone, who's still a friend of mine to this day, was one of my mentors. So, and you know, you can't appreciate these things when you're 19, but I had this classically trained British director and this Canadian theater, a really Canadian acting icon in Tyrone. He's yeah. been doing this who I just got to learn the business from. And Tyrone to this day has been a friend and mentor to me. So I was really, really lucky. Oh, that's amazing. You then kept on acting in Montreal and we have, you were at Centaur in Blue Orange. I think we have an image from that show. Um, yeah. We have the, the, the yeah, with Ryan wow. Hallman. So that was uh, in 2003. And that's an amazing play actually. How, how was that? Uh, to kind of delve into that relationship in that play as an actor. It was incredible. I, I, I feel honestly like one of the luckiest artists in the world. Like I, it was a, it, it was an incredible experience. Ryan Hollyman is still a dear friend of mine to this day. Mm -hmm. I love Ian D. Clark. I haven't seen him. And put, I just, and, and the, the late great Ken Livingston was so lovely who directed that play. And wow. honestly, and Chris Hidalgo was the stage manager. We're still <laughs> friends to this day. Like I just remember laughing all the time. I remember we we would just laugh in rehearsal and had and it was this joyous experience of making art. And of course, Joe Pennell, a brilliant playwright, uh, for anybody listening now who's like a TV fan, Joe Pennell actually was the main writer and creator of the show Mindhunter that ran on, I think it was a, a Netflix. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, you can actually, if you listen to the monologues, Mindhunter is the show that tracks like the first detectives that discovered the idea of serial killers. But he, if you listen to the monologues he writes for these people, you can tell it's a theater person just by the, the way he right. uses text. Right? But it was it was a brilliant experience. I just got spoiled early in my career working with amazing writing and amazing artists who took the work seriously, but not themselves. Yeah, that's so it's so key to our 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 craft really is to take mm -hmm. the work seriously first before anything mm -hmm. else. You mm. also um, worked with some a young playwright here with Infinite Theater. You did a beautiful production of a play called Gas by Jason Akinoy. And I yeah. uh, have an image of that uh, show to, on the, that we can look at. Um, wow, that's crazy. 
What a great picture that is. Um, and I know you did that with uh, Infinite Theater, but you also did it in a prison, if I'm, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you've mm -hmm. talked about that a little bit, right? Is that the show you did in the prison? We, that show was, we did it in uh, the Bay Saint Michel, I think it used to be called. It was, it was a, yeah. a pool. It used to be a pool uh, that they converted. And I, I can't remember if we did a reading of that one in a prison. I, oh, there was a, I read something okay. on uh, in one of your in looking looking around at you. <laughs> um, I read that you had done some some work performing in a prison, and that the experience of that was really interesting. Well, so, I I did so. I um, my Diane Roberts and myself uh, run a company called Bold School Productions, and Diane's a friend and a mentor who I've worked with for many many years. Met her through Black Theater Workshop. Also, she directed Common Man's Guide to Loving Women by the great Andrew Moody. So we created this hip hop theater workshop called Bold School, where we, we taught youth how to express themselves through hip hop and theater. And we had the opportunity to go to a youth detention center. So essentially a prison for youth in Vancouver. So we shared elements of, of Sal Capone with these uh, young offenders and we, we helped them learn how to rap and how to express themselves. And it was it was transformative just seeing the just the in integrity and honesty and and the brilliance of these these youth who were dealing with some things was incredible can you talk that's i wanted to talk exactly about that about your relationship with diane and with the creation of sal capone um that was can you talk about what inspired that show and and yeah. then the process of making it yeah so that was around um I think it was 2007, I had moved from this point. Uh, in 2006, I moved from Montreal to Vancouver in pursuit of more uh, TV work. And of course, dove headlong into theater as soon as I got to Vancouver because you can not you can never leave the theater. Anyone listening who thinks you can, you just never do. If it's in you, it's in you. Uh, but I was doing <laughs> extra work on this film called Shooter, this Mark Wahlberg movie, which is, that could be a play in and of itself. They literally bust... 60 black actors to Clinton, British Columbia, so we could play African militia members because there's no black people in, in Clinton, BC. That's a whole other conversation, but also a transformative experience. But while I was um, shooting that movie in Clinton, BC, the, the, a news report came on about Freddie Villanueva, mm -hmm. uh, the young uh, BIPOC uh, youth who was shot by police in Montreal. And I remember being so upset and frustrated. This was pre-Black Lives Matter, pre Trayvon Martin, you know, I, I remember being so upset about this and talking to Diane just as a friend about this. And she was the one who suggested that I write a play about it. So I, I, I quite literally owe Diane for my, for my playwriting career. She's the one who inspired me to, and I, at the time I was like, I was like, well, I'd never written a play. I was, I had been a hip hop artist and I was a slam poet, but I'd never written a play. Mm -hmm. And Diane was like, well, why don't you combine the two? So that's that's what inspired me was seeing that story and Diane encouraging me to do it. Amazing. And so you produced that here in Montreal, didn't you? Yeah. It, well, at the time, Diane was the artistic director of Urban Inc. Theater in Vancouver. So we started developing it through Urban Inc. Uh, she she had me as artist in residence and hell, I should I was going to say held my hand, but dragged me kicking and screaming because <laughs> writing plays is really hard. And uh, you, you need a strong mentor to keep you on path. And Diane has, has been incredibly patient in doing so. But she guided me to writing the first draft in Vancouver and got it from really an, a, a mess, an unmanageable mess to a, a great piece of theater and then sent that to Black Theater Workshop. And my dear friend, uh, Quincy Armour, who at the time was artistic director of Black Theater Workshop, read the play and uh, included it in the season. So it, it my playwriting debut started at Black Theater Workshop, as well as my acting debut also started. So I, I have a lot of love and admiration for Black Theater Workshop as an organization. It's an amazing company. I'm so grateful to be in the same city as them. They really are, they are yeah. special. And um, and so so you you got into to becoming a, so did you got into becoming a playwright? Did you fully switch? Or uh, obviously you were still acting at that point as mm -hmm. well. So you were doing theater in Vancouver and and writing these plays. And mm -hmm. then um, you got into television. Can you talk a little bit about what, what drew you, you said you moved to Vancouver to start doing more TV. What drew yeah. you to television as an actor and film? Because <laughs> you've done some amazing stuff. I mean, Blue Ridge, yeah. uh, Blue, what's it? Um, what's Blue, it? Ma Blue Mountain State. Blue and Mountain State, 
yes. I'm gonna, I'll be very candid. Uh, money drew me to. <laughs> 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 but uh, you know, I I want to be very, especially if young artists are listening here, right? There's this popular thing now about like calling artists multi hyphenates, right? This is like this new thing of like you do, you, which and I guess by definition I am, I write, I direct, I whatever. But I want people to understand that this comes from just like miserable failure in many different fields that necessitated diversifying my skill set because I'm still not, look, I say this with humility and honesty. I'm not, a, I'm not that great of an actor, right? I'm not Denzel Washington or I'm not Meryl Streep. So I'm not a great enough actor to rely on people just needing to hire me for my skills as an actor. And I'm not that great of a writer in a world where, you know, I mean, August Wilson exists. I'm not that great of a writer. I'm not that great of a director in a world where a number of directors. So it's one of those things where if you have the humility to go, I'm not transformative in any of these realms to think that I'm owed work in any of them. So I better understand my business so that I can find a way to keep myself uh, working. That's well, what it I, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Well, the, yeah, just that's that's what it is. Is I was drawn to to television because, well, I'll be, I'll be very candid. Uh, I had done Blue Orange at the Centaur, and it went very well. The play was nominated. This is back when we used to have Soirée des Masques. Today we have the the Meta Awards, but Soirée des Masques was like French theater and English theater, and so the play was nominated for best English production. And I was very lucky to be nominated for best supporting actor, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, and I didn't, not only did I not book any work for the next year, I didn't have one audition for the next year. And I said, I need to, if I plan on like sustaining myself as an artist, something's got to change. Cause I was, you know, yeah, you, yeah, you can't do much better than being in a play at, at the Centaur, which is the, the regional in Montreal, it getting nominated for all these, and I didn't have one audition for a year. So I realized I needed to to do something. Broad the horizons. I think you're too. You're, I think you're too modest about your skills, both as an actor and a writer. Just want to go online. To, oh, that's, <laughs> really that's fine. And I also think that, but what you're saying is really important. A friend of mine, Raul Benesha, an actor and musician in Toronto, who I'm really good friends with, had he he loves baseball, and I said, "Why do you love baseball so much?" And he said, "Because it's just like acting." I said, "How is it just like acting?" He says, "You swing at the ball all the time, and you only hit a home run very, very rarely." <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I tell my students this because I also teach at Vancouver Film School is like, yeah, if you have a 30 percent success rate, which, of course, by definition means you have a 70 percent failure rate in baseball, you're in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. You, bet, you bet 300. And I'm like, and acting is very similar. If I booked 30 percent of my auditions or got 30 percent of the, the, the grants I applied for, I'd be a billionaire. Yeah, no, exactly. So I think I think that's an important uh, like aspect of this business for all of us. It's you're, it's not it's the same for absolutely everybody in it. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to also talk uh, for you to talk a little bit about um, being you're you're married actually to a playwright. If I'm uh, to Amy Lavoie, yeah. and um, that's really rare. I think for two play, two artists in the same discipline to not only like get together, get married, but also work together. Mm -hmm. And you guys are writing a new play, um, or maybe it's already written. I, can you, it's a uh, red bone coon hound. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, in that process? we're writing several uh, projects together actually. And, and it's funny. Um, you mentioned Jason Maganoy's gas. And I know that before we started live, I mentioned this, but yeah, my, my wife and I met in the theater. Uh, and in oh. fact, she saw me for the first time, she said, uh, during Jason Maganoy's gas. And she, you know, she said this publicly, so this is not me. She would, she would share the story, but I, we joke about it today, where she came with her friend, who's now my dear friend, Christina Culeandro. Oh. And, and she, yeah, this one of my, one of our best friends. And she saw my, my headshot uh, in outside, uh, you know, in the lobby. And I joke because that was about 10 years and 25 pounds ago. But she saw... <laughs> <laughs> she saw my headshot and, and looked over. Christina made a joke and said, well, there's my future husband. So I'll be taking that. And uh, she, yeah, she saw me in the play. And then she said she really liked my voice, like the sound of my voice. So she was at the time finishing playwriting at the National Theatre School of Canada and mm -hmm. was writing a play. And there was a black character in the piece. So she started writing it, picturing me playing it and then asked the school if they could get me to be in it. And th at the time I was living in Vancouver and Brian Drader, who's a dear friend of ours to say, who was running playwriting, as, as you know, uh, for somehow NTS agreed to fly me in to act in this play. So we met through her seeing it a play. Then she cast me in her work. And I was, she's been my favorite writer ever since I, I read her play. 
Oh, that's incredible. I love that story. And I think something that's coming out in, in the way you're talking is this network of artists that we all kind of connect to and how important that network of people really is in your creative life. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm, I'm in, it inspires me to think back to all the people who I've, con like, like our Raul or, you know, all the different people that you just meet in different ways and they keep coming back and, and giving you new Mm -hmm. energy and new breath for the work i know raul as well we we're, we're facebook friends i don't know if we've i haven't seen him in person for a while but we keep in touch uh, online so he's a lovely yeah. guy well if you're mm -hmm. watching i will say <laughs> he, I'll, i always talk to him on a regular basis so i'll tell him to say, i'll tell him he said that um you're you're now so it's, it's cut to, you and diane are still speaking of that network of people you and diane are still collaborators all these mm -hmm. years later and in mm -hmm. fact, you're developing, or you've, I think it's complete, is it complete now, um, Black and Blue Matters? So yeah. you've, you're already all the way into that. How, how has that process been? Because I know it started, it was meant to be premiering before when the pandemic hit. Yeah. So can you talk about the, it, and it's connected to Sal Capone a little bit. It, it's like it, a companion, it in fact. It is, yeah. So we actually had our first uh, public reading. Uh, well, not, not our first public reading. We had an early draft read a year ago, but um, two days ago uh, at the Siegel Center, where we were actually we were actually supposed to debut at the Siegel Center before moving to the National Arts Center. But the pandemic, like so many live performers know, has disrupted everything. But we had like, you know, sort of a staged reading uh, in public recently, and it's it's been an amazing process and the extra time the pandemic has brought us has been a blessing, but I, I'd be lying if I didn't say like it, it's been a really difficult piece to, to write for, mm -hmm. for a number of reasons, the pandemic being one of them. I, I just like so many artists, I was really depressed for large portions of the pandemic. One, because like, like everyone, like I saw, I remember two years ago seeing 95% of my income and 95% of the jobs I had booked for the year literally dissipate and just in, in a two week span, just email after, I mean, everybody went through it, right? Just canceled, canceled, canceled. And just being faced for the, you know, for the first time in my life at age 40 with questioning, like, have I, have I made a mistake? <laughs> you know, it, yeah. like, is, is our industry going to come back? Uh, and, and this, just realizing how vulnerable we are uh, as the artists and as theater artists, it was a really sobering experience. And then, of course, writing this play about police brutality and anti-Black racism, and then the George Floyd video goes viral, and and the world, especially in North America, has this reckoning with anti-Black racism and and the Black Lives Matter movement. Like it was all too much to navigate during a pandemic. And there was long periods where I couldn't even look at the play. Yeah. I think that's important to remember too, that we all think that the Black Lives Matter movement began with George Floyd, but it began way, way, be you know, uh, yeah. it, it's, it's, you know, you mentioned Trayvon Martin. This was the actual, this is a picture of the um, workshop production that you did, that uh, Black Theater Workshop did in mm. the park in Little Burgundy. It was an amazing thing to see. It was so powerful um, mm -hmm. that evening. And I know you worked with Diane on that. Nalo Soyini Bruce did the design was, and the filmmaking in that was amazing as well. Um, I'm so glad I got to see that. And I, I'm, I'm so looking forward to the premiere actually mm -hmm. when it does finally happen um, of the full play. Do, do, is, there a, is there a trajectory now? Is there a time when it's gonna come? There is, but I don't even know at this point. <laughs> what I'm allowed to say or what's confirmed. Yeah, or what fair enough. Yeah. There, I can promise there is, there will be a production. <laughs> and will it be in Montreal or will it start at the NAC? There will be a production in Montreal that okay. will then go to Ottawa at the National Arts Center. So I, that's much I can promise. I don't I know. get a chance to see it. That's what yeah. I thought. That's my main thing. <laughs> yeah, you'll have a chance to see it and hear it. And, and yeah, it's, we're very excited. Um, you mentioned that you had a rough time through the pandemic as we all did, but in spite of that, you still kept working. And part of that, I, we, we've been collaborating over the pandemic with Boca del Lupo because they're such an exciting uh, experimental company. They come up with so many ways to make things happen. And one of the ways they did was the red phone. Um, so they commissioned you to write a play for people to, that aren't actors to perform. And mm -hmm. uh, it, was so, it, was, it was a great piece. And can you talk Thank a little you. bit about that play um, that you did? For yeah. Boca. 
yeah I, well one thank you and i'm glad it resonated with you but uh i mean that piece i uh, was called uh, are we good and it it really is like uh, uh a snapshot of what my life was like in the midst of this pandemic and in the midst of you know the george floyd yeah. video going viral whereas you know a lot like a lot of writers the stuff i write is deeply personal and one of my best friends uh who is a police officer uh you know we have had many disagreements over the years about a number of things and this piece reflects one of those disagreements where he you know like so many people that aren't you know i've i've been engaged in these conversations about social justice and i i watch a lot of uh, youtube and stay plugged in and and he like many people that's not his thing he cuz you know and he he had sent me this video by um conservative alt-right pundit uh candace owens oh and God. yeah i know i know this is the this is anybody who knows who's familiar with the work and is involved in these conversations knows that this is just like but this is what's so scary about these grifters right is that to to people who aren't in the know they can make compelling arguments right they seem like reasonable people and they seem like they're they're really good at seeming like they're appealing to to people's rationale and so he shared this um this video with me think just kind of being like hey this this is something to check out isn't this an interesting counterpoint to uh th everything being said about george floyd and it it just enraged me right i just i got really upset and i i just and for the first time in our fr friendship we had a big fight and we're, we're still fine but you know the, the piece just reflected the i want to be careful with my words but the unconscious bias and casual um, really racism or insensitivity that some white people, even if they're very close, like I, I love him. He was, a, he's one of my best friends. He was a, a groomsman at my wedding, but the, the level of understanding between things that black people or BIPOC people deal with on a regular basis and things that haven't mattered to white people can sometimes be massive. And, and that's what that piece reflected. But I think that's what's so wonderful. What was wonderful about it is that theater can address that and bring us into that conversation in a way that is so profound. You know, we it's in, and it's so key to us going beyond where we are as a community and this kind of polarized community. We we have to talk about exactly that. We have to talk about it. And that piece gave a window onto how you do it. It was really, really great. Um, yeah, there, were, there was the, the phone booth at the Portico Project in mm -hmm. 2020. And then um, Boca did another really interesting thing. They created the, the um, this sort of initiative to get, because when the pandemic, as it rolled into its second year and we were trying to get everyone to get vaccinated, they recognized that young people were hesitant and, and resistant a little bit. And so they commissioned playwrights across the country to write short audio plays mm -hmm. for to in, encourage um, vaccine uh, hesitant youth to get vaccinated. And yours was yes, called Vax Pass. It was yes. such a great opportunity to, I had, you know, it's the one little chance I've had to actually work on your work because I, I directed the, the, mm -hmm. the reading and, um, and got to work with the, we had such a great crew of young actors from here yeah. in Montreal. And I, I think back to you back in, in 2000 and was it 2003 when you did Or Blue Orange? Yeah. And you know, and there was nothing to do. And I look now and I see the city changing. Yeah. I see all these young actors here working. And I mean, it's, it's still a tricky room sure. in general for even just English actors, not let alone BIPOC actors, but, um, yeah. but it is, it is shifting and it's because of artists like you who have blazed a trail and, and spoken up and said, this isn't enough. You, we, mm -hmm. everyone needs to do better. Um, well, and I, I have to put thank you for saying that, but I have to, you know, also mention that I stand on the shoulders of people like, you know, uh, Diane Roberts, uh, Dennis Simpson, Tyron Benskin, Nigel Sean Williams, you know, like it, it's a continuum. Like I, I have the opportunities I have today come because Winston, Winston Sutton, the, you know, there are people who, who blazed this trail as artists and founded companies like Black Theatre Workshop or Obsidian Theatre uh, in, in Toronto that allow Black artists like me today to have a platform. And it's really important to, to remember that. Yeah, it's great. I want to just, as we, we've, we've kind of gone around the things uh, a little bit, but I want to come back for a minute to um, your, 
your TED talk, and it was called The Essential Service of Art. And for all of you watching today, I really recommend that you check it out. We have a link on our website in the Saturday Salon page. Um, in it, you, you really created a very precise and poignant rap essay on how art can save your life, whether you're making it or consuming it. And I, I was just blown away by it. Can you talk where, about where that, that uh, essay came from? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, it was, again, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, but it's true. A lot of my work comes from vacillating between <laughs> crippling depression <laughs> and absolute joy and gratitude. <laughs> And I say this, you know, I'm, I'm happily married. I'm gainfully employed. I I don't want people to be worried or anything. But like, you know, as a sensitive person and as an artist, you turn the TV on or you look out the window and it's just like, it, it, it can be overwhelming. I mean, you know, we were talking about the horrific tragedy happening now uh, with Russia invading Ukraine and, and countless other atrocities where it's poor people who are just trying to live their lives, who are at the mercy of people with power doing all this this hor these, this horrible stuff that affects people and doesn't affect the people committing these acts. Anyway, it gets it becomes crippling. And um, I just started reflecting on how truly it was art that sustained me and so many others during this pandemic, mm -hmm. during George, during what was happening with George Floyd, during was, like everybody was at home watching Netflix, listening to their favorite albums, you know, um, painting or sculpting whatever it was it was it's truly it was art that would that sustained people and and has sustained people through tragedy and then also thinking about when times are going well when you have certain people and i don't want to i don't want to pick on certain sides of the political spectrum but certain sides of the political spectrum have this stereotypical idea of artists like we just sit around drinking cocktails collecting grant checks and and you know Mm -hmm. you know always trying to slash budgets to whether it's the cbc or canada council and they have no respect for what artists do and the combination of both of those things led me to write this this or this realization that art truly is an essential service yes. you know it, it's it's it is truly life saving and can be life changing and i i just think i wanted to i just thought if this is the last message i leave on the earth because you know who gets to do a ted talk right I, when they ask me to do a ted talk i'm like this better be good because it's going to exist forever <laughs> so i said what's the message i want to leave in a capsule that this is the last thing i say and i think this it's kind of the it summarizes my my life experiences and how i feel just how important art is and how essential it is as a service well that is so beautifully put and it is so um, reassuring to hear a fellow artist talk about it, because as we all, as you say, we've all been so isolated through the pandemic. And it's so easy to forget that we're all in this together and that we're all trying to do the same thing. And, and I just think that message is, is, rings out uh, from you, Omari, and in all the work of yours that I've seen and read. And I, I just cannot wait till, uh, Black and Blue Matters hits the stage because, and and also I'm really happy to you because your work introduced me to Diane Roberts, um, and mm -hmm. and she's such a force mm -hmm. um, in this in this community and and in the work that she does and in all the all the the the, the way she approaches the theater as well. So mm -hmm. thank you for that um, oh. that sort of creative introduction on that. Oh, my pleasure. Diane's brilliant. I you know I. I I owe her so much as an actor, as a writer, as a director, really. I, I realize now now I have the opportunity to direct as well. And really, I'm just stealing a lot of the stuff that I've learned from her. She she has a really holistic, humanistic approach to working with actors and directing that I it resonated so much with me when I was a young actor. Actually, interesting story, Quincy Armour and I met working on uh, A Common Man's Guide to Loving Women that Diane directed in 2005. So, oh, I didn't realize that. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's started well what's amazing is now you know quincy for a decade was artistic director of likely to workshop i have acted in a number of shows there and now they're producing my work as a writer but diane is sort of this um linchpin and guiding force as a as a mentor and inspiration for a generation of young black actors so and a catalyst as well which seems as well which is so fantastic yeah. so you we're almost at the end of our time together today but i wanted to just you've been getting up at like four in the morning um, doing uh, your your very public service 
um, for Black History Month, talking to students across the country. Um, and, and how's that been? What have, can you talk a little bit about what that what you've been doing with that? It's been a blessing. Uh, it's So for the last decade now, my twin sister and I, I have a twin sister named Akila Newton. She oh. runs a non-for-profit organization that's Montreal-based, but now it's really a national and even international organization called Overture with the Arts. And when we were in school, we went to Beaconsfield High School, and 1995 was when Jean Augustine, the first Black female member of Parliament, uh, suggested we celebrate Black History Month in Canada. And it was ever since 96, Canada has been celebrating Black History Month. And we remembered being in school and hearing that we're going to recognize Black History Month and being really excited as young Black students, but then nothing happened. <laughs> Here's just, the one. <laughs> yeah, people just went, it's Black History Month. And we're like, okay, are we going to learn about like Black History? Like, the, our country, we didn't ask for this. Our country has said we're going to honor a month to celebrate the contributions of Black people. Shouldn't we do something? <laughs> and it's funny, like literally when my sister and I were 16 and 17, we were like, you know, if we ever if we ever have a chance to like teach about Black history, we should do this because there's a, we knew from our parents because they again we, my parents were really cool. They had all these books. I remember reading the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was fourteen. Like my parents were like, you should read this book. I was like, okay. I remember reading like James Baldwin and Bell Hooks. These were all just like my parents have the coolest library ever in our place. Anyway, <laughs> so we were like, if we ever have your a, parents, <laughs> they're pretty awesome. They're yeah. my parents. Were, I'm 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 super super lucky. But yeah. So, uh, yeah, at a very young age, I, I realized that we wanted to tell these stories. And then it started off in person where I would go to Montreal and I would go to schools and gyms and auditoriums and combine spoken word and acting and comedy. And I would just tell these stories about uh, first it started off as just black history. So it was a lot of American history, you know, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. And students were like, well, what about Canada? And I was like, yeah, you're right. So for the past eight years. We've been doing uh, stories about Black Canadians, and we're currently doing something called Tracking Black Canada, where we talk about historically Black neighborhoods like Little Burgundy in Montreal, uh, Amber Valley in Alberta, Hogan's Alley in Vancouver, and people from those neighborhoods and what they've done. And it's it's been on Zoom, and it's blown up to the point where I've spent all of February from 4 a.m. Vancouver time till about 3 p.m. Uh, Vancouver time, because it's a lot of schools in the East Coast, just doing this presentation six a day for a month. And it's been incredible. Well, we're, what a, what a lucky generation to have you introducing them to the stories of their country. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> Listen, I feel lucky that is, I, I love performing and I love writing. I love just talking to youth. The fact that they're, they're interested in hearing me talk about something that interests me is I'm very, very lucky. It doesn't feel like work. It feels like an essential service. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great spot to 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 round us up with. Omari, thank you so much for joining us today. It's uh -huh. it's a real privilege to meet you and talk to you. And like I said, I'm really looking forward to finding a way to bringing you back to the Centaur stage in the very near future. So thank you. I'm thank I'm you. humbled and honored, and it'd, it'd be my pleasure. I had, a, I had an amazing time last time I worked there way back in. Oh, three. <laughs> and I, I'd love to one day. Isn't it, doesn't it scare you when you realize that things in the 2000s are a long time ago when that seemed like this so di distant future? When <laughs> <laughs> It's terrifying. It's terrifying. <laughs> well, even when you realize you've been friends with people, like with your your new friends, like my when I moved to Vancouver in 06, that was my new city. And my, my new friends I've known for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> when you get older, it even gets harder. <laughs> yeah. but, th but thank you so much. This was such a lovely, easy, open conversation. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate it very much. It's, it's, uh, Montreal has brought so many wonderfully um, diverse in every way, not, not only in terms of, of BIPOC, but also in terms of skills and talents and stories and approaches. Uh, it's such a unique city, so it's great yeah. to be able to celebrate that, and uh, especially talking to you is a way of doing that. So thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm a proud Montreal son. Even if I'm living on the West Coast now, I'm I'm. It's always a pleasure to come back and work there. Awesome, awesome. Um, I just want to uh, just mention that at Centaur, we're so grateful for the support of our season sponsor here, Hydro Quebec. Um, they have kept us going through the ups and downs of the pandemic, and we really couldn't do it without them. And I also, in this, as, as uh, Omari mentioned, um, I wanna take a moment to send our thoughts to the people of Ukraine as they fight against this horrible invasion. 
Uh, if you can, please support them by contributing to the Humanitarian Crisis Appeal at the Canadian Red Cross. Uh, this is unprecedented time in our history as a peop as people on Earth, and uh, the people in Ukraine are fighting for the freedoms that they um, have the right to. So I encourage everyone to support them if you can. Thank you all for joining us today. And I also want to thank our behind the scenes team at Centaur, Vanessa Rigo and Edwa Savoy for getting us online for the Saturday Salon. And stay tuned for news about the next one. I mean, the good thing about the online thing is that we can talk to Omari even if he's not in Montreal right this minute. So I'm, I'm happy the pandemic taught us that one good lesson. Happy Saturday. Stay warm and please don't slip. It's very icy out there. See you soon. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.